Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Form Check Friday. Now, this is the show where we review your viewer submitted videos. And if you're wondering how to get featured on Form Check Friday, you go ahead and click the annotation above. That'll take you to a guide on how to submit. Now, we left off last week with Bram. Now, Bram is uh, 23. He's been training for about a year and a half. And uh, he says he has some, like, good morning squat issues, the, the fabled squat morning. Um, <clears throat> he says he doesn't feel like his legs are getting loaded when he squats. And he also asked specifically about flats versus heels. So while watching this squat, I do notice it becomes quickly apparent that we definitely get the knees shooting back and the hips shooting up out of the bottom. So I think there's a number of things we can do about that. One of them being putting a little bit more pressure on the forefoot. Now, a lot of times when uh, we're learning squatting, a lot of the sort of predominant cues that people are, are throwing around are to sit back and to put the weight on your heels. And I think that for a certain population, this is all well and good, but in some cases it ends up a little bit exaggerated. Now, uh, I would like for you, Bram, to put a little bit more pressure through your forefoot. I'd like you to think about keeping your knees forward as you come up out of the hole. So if I draw a line there, you're gonna be able to see how far that knee comes forward. And the first thing that happens is that knee shoots back. Now, another thing that I'm seeing that often kind of comes hand in hand with this is we are getting a little bit of knee valgus. And what I mean by that is the knees are sort of bowing inwards. Not necessarily a big deal, but a lot of times that points me towards, okay, well maybe we're seeing those knees come in forward, which contributes to the knees coming back and the hips coming up. Maybe that's all a part of the stance being just a little bit too wide as well. So I would potentially play with a narrower stance. I would cue those knees forward, keep some pressure through that forefoot. And um, in terms of the flats versus heels, man, just grab some, uh, grab some five pound plates or two and a half kilo plates and just stick them under where you set up your heels and just try it out. Or better yet, if you can get a pair of weightlifting shoes to try before you invest in them, you're probably gonna be able to notice a difference pretty quickly if there's gonna be a difference for you. Some people, it could kind of go either way, uh, but for some people, it's a it's a very drastic difference. So the first time I ever wore a heeled shoe, I noticed a very distinct difference. Getting to depth was more comfortable and it just, it turned out to be my preferred way to squat and I could tell very quickly. So hopefully some of that helps you and we'll move on to the next one here. Now our next submission here is Connor's bench press. Now Connor has been lifting for about a year. Uh, he says he's got a football background. He wants to give a shout out to his cat, which I think is a very fair ask. And uh, he says he's having trouble progressing. He's got some lockout issues. Um, and this is 225 for five. He said it was around an RP 7.5. So. The first thing I'm going to notice here, uh, and I, we actually have a command for this on our Twitch and in our Discord, is think about widening your grip. This to me looks like a very narrow grip. We can see the end of the knurling is here and your grip is here. So I'm going to guess that you're inside of even the rings on the bar. And um, I'm not saying that going wider is necessarily going to fix everything, um, but it might be beneficial. It might be worth investigating. Um, I try not to give hard cues and say, oh, absolutely, this is going to make you better because it, lifting doesn't really work like that. There's far too many individual differences. But one of the things we will say is, hey, these are some things that are worth investigating. And I think in your case, a bit of a wider grip would be worth investigating. Um, also, I would like to see, uh, generally speaking for most trainees, I'd like to see a little bit more consistency off the chest. So if you can make sure that your bar is going that same path every time, a lot of times we get into this really sort of jumpy leg drive. Um, we're not really keeping the chest up between attempts. We're kind of falling down a little bit, or sorry, between reps rather. And um, you know, this, this level of the chest is falling quite significantly throughout. You can see a little bit of blue poking through there when we set up. This is great. This is great. You want to stay as big as you can out of the rack. Keep that chest up to meet the bar, but watch how much it falls even by rep two, rep three. We're really starting to flatten out. Now, I'm personally more a fan of a lighter touch, uh, but I do know there's a lot of athletes that bench a lot of weight with more of a sink and heave pattern. So if you're gonna do that, we just have to make sure you're keeping that chest up, maintain that leg drive a little bit more between reps, and let's experiment with a bit of a wider grip. See if that helps you, man. Our next lifter here is Eric, and he's doing some sumo deadlifts. He says he's been lifting for four or five years, um, switching back to sumo from conventional currently, and uh, that this set was maybe a PR, but wondering, you know, sort of if there's anything that he can do a little bit better. Now, it looks to me like we start in a pretty darn good position. However, if you'll notice, 
there's a, a lot of kind of like bouncing around as we begin to actually lift the bar off the floor, right? Which tells me we could do a lot better job of pulling the slack out of the bar. I don't think we're tight enough through the lats. Uh, I think we're more sitting down than we are kind of pulling ourselves into position. So I think in a lot of ways, we need to get tighter. We need to create more tension against the bar before the attempt is made to actually initiate the lift. And uh, I think we'll see a little bit better uh, pulling the slack out of the bar, we call it, on rep two here, because you've, you've kind of already gone through a rep, you know the tension requirements, you know kind of what it's gonna take, but you can see um, from this start position to when we go, like if we mark kind of around the shoulder there, you can see how much movement there is in the shoulder. So we could definitely pack those lats down harder. Um, we're losing a tiny little bit of back position, which whether or not that's gonna make or break your lift, tough to say. Um, but we are seeing the hips kind of change from their initial position. So I'd like to see your position here before the bar leaves the floor, a little more similar to the position here when we actually break the floor. So pulling more slack out of the bar. And what I mean by that is instead of just sitting your butt down and, and kind of starting to lift, I want you to think of leveraging yourself against the bar. I want you to think of actually using your lats to kind of pack tension downwards and tighten the lats and shoulder blades kind of down into the hip. So we're loading the quads, hamstrings and glutes. Everything is really, really tight before we even lift the bar off the floor. And you'll notice the better you pull the slack out of the bar, the more bow there's gonna be in this bar before it leaves the floor. Now this is actually pretty decent, but I think we can pull even more slack out of the bar so we don't get that jolt forward as the bar comes up off the floor. We could be a little bit better prepared to initiate the lift. All told, um, your lockouts are clean. I mean, the knees are straight here. We're dead. There's no question on whether or not the shoulders are through this way. Um, it's just in this sort of initial phase of the range of motion that we're losing a little bit of position. And I think uh, perhaps incorporating some pause deadlifts as well as just practicing levering yourself into the bar a little bit more could go a long ways for you. All right, and our next lifter here is Alejandro, and he's doing some squatting. He says he's 20 years old. Uh, he's trained powerlifting for four years. Good for you, starting at 16. That's uh, in my books. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, he says he aspires to compete at next Mexican nationals, and um, he used to squat super wide in what he says is hyper extended. And generally, what we're talking about here is going to be you can see how there's even a little bit of flexion in his uh, position right now. So he says he narrowed things up and he tries to stay a little bit more sort of neutral range, um, a little bit of like anti extension, if you will. And um, he says he feels like he rounds over quite a bit when he does that and that his squat just isn't progressing. Now he mentioned previously that the reason he changed was because he thought that these, this sort of positional difference previously um, was something that was causing him a lot of pain um, and, and a lot of sort of issues. Now, when we talk about bracing for the squat, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in our uh, upcoming squat tutorial guide, um, but one of the big things is that people tend to fall into one of two categories when it comes to squat bracing. And uh, category one would be sort of a little bit more of an extended position. And the second sort of brace will have a little bit more flexion. They'll be cueing a little bit more sort of ribs down in the front. Um, and there is no better, but generally speaking, people will find one of the two is better for them. Now, I would almost recommend you allow yourself to go back into a little bit more flexion here. Uh, I think what we've done is create uh, a fair bit, or sorry, I misspoke. I would like you to go back into a little bit more extension in the low back. Um, I think potentially what we've done here is create a totally new bracing system, and we may just not be as strong that way. Uh, it could be that changing the stance or even just deloading for a while was enough to kind of alleviate some of those injury and pain symptoms you were feeling. Um, it may not be inherent to the way that you were moving. Sometimes there can be a bit of a disconnect between, you know, technique and pain. Uh, that's not to say that there's no mechanical sort of uh, component to, to pain and injuries, but that's often not the full picture. So um, I think right now, due to the fact that we're not able to maintain this kind of flexed brace, 
uh, it may be worthwhile to reinvestigate if we can get away with that little bit of extension, if that feels a little bit more comfortable, and if the squat is progressing. The other thing is that progression is not always tied to technique. This technique might be just fine. It might be your programming that you need to investigate. So we can look at uh, the overall amount of stress that uh, you're, you're using with your squat variations and your programming. You know, look at uh, increasing or decreasing uh, things like frequency, volume, intensity. Um, you know, make sure that you have some sort of system set up to auto-regulate, whether that's RPE or not. Uh, auto-regulation, I think, is a part of any smart program. So there's a lot to unpack and a lot to investigate there. Uh, I would say that, you know, checking into or, or seeing what it's like to squat with a little bit of extension again uh, or a little bit more extended than you are here might be worth checking out. I'm not going to say that's the be-all end-all, but uh, a little bit of extension might put you in a bit of a stronger feeling position, a little bit more of a familiar position, as well as I would definitely investigate your programming if you're not making progress on a given lift right now. All right, we've got some bench press here from Mikkel. And uh, he says he's been training about eight months, but he just can't keep his butt down. Now, unfortunately, there's no sexy trick, uh, sexy answer or quick and easy cue to get you to keep your butt down other than keep your damn butt down. Um, the, the few things that I would work on and investigate here are, okay, um, we're pretty lax in the legs on the way down, and then we get a lot of leg drive on the way up. We need to get our feet and our legs into a position where we can have a lot of leg drive the whole time, but keep the butt on the, on the bench, right? So in some cases, that's going to be moving your feet out this way, maybe moving them back this way, but look at your foot position um, as, a, as a way to try to experiment with being able to keep your butt down. Also, you know, maybe you're just using too much leg drive. You need to learn to use enough that your butt's kind of hovering and that we can reinforce this arch but not so much that, I mean like this second rep, you're a mile off the bench, like way, way up. So, I mean, it's not as easy as like, oh, you know, if you just do this one thing, um, but this is a starting place, right? Start with, okay, can I change my foot position so I can still use leg drive to contribute to my arch, to contribute to my bench press without my butt coming up based on a different position? And if not, okay, maybe we need to look at how we're using the leg drive. Right now, you're using the leg drive to press the bar. Now, I want you to think of using leg drive instead to reinforce your position, to put pressure on your upper traps and to drive yourself this way up the bench. And if you can do that, perhaps that will allow you to sort of conceptualize your leg drive a little bit differently so you're using it um, for, you know, uh, something that's not gonna lift your butt off the bench every time you bench press uh, heavy weights, so. It's a common problem. Uh, I think a common thing that a lot of people deal with even at the elite level. Um, but yeah, that would be my take on how to how to go about setting up a process whereby you don't run into this issue anymore. Well, I hope that helps, man. And our final submission here comes from Adam. Adam says he's having some trouble with his sumo deadlift. He says he loses position around the knees. He feels like he's really strong off the floor, but has a hard time once he gets to and past the knees. So what we're going to do is we're going to let this play through a couple more times. And I want everybody watching, if they have any interest, to go down into the comments below and leave some constructive criticism for our boy Adam here. Now, if you have uh, any, any kind of advice for Adam, like I said, leave in the comments below. If you have any comments or questions of anything that I talked about throughout this episode, go ahead and leave that in the comments below. I'd love to enter a, a discussion with anybody about any of the strategies that I've mentioned. And um, yeah, we'll make sure we see everybody in the next one. Take care.